Good morning, TWU and Denton. Wow. I love your city. I love your friendliness. And I would like to say to the Chancellor, I understand you're a techie. I mean, I'm not. Sorry. We're all techies. You're a trekkie. Is that correct? A trekkie. So I'm told today I am your Tasha Yar. For those of you who don't know what that means, it's the specialist, the security specialist, and all is well. <laughs> and thank you to Nancy and Ted Pop for making this all possible for me to be here today. I'm flattered, I'm delighted, and I hope at the end of the day you, you've really found something that, that strikes you at home. You know, in these days of guns and whatever, I was actually hired to protect some of the most important people in the world. And yes, I did carry a firearm. And the crazy thing now is that that's what everyone wants to know is if I'm carrying. <laughs> Particularly Ben. <laughs> <laughs> so this one fellow I was doing this big speech, it was mostly a male audience, and he said, so are you carrying Agent Clark? And I said, I'm not going to tell you, but if I don't get a standing at the end, I'm going to shoot you in the knee. <laughs> so I always get standing. So. <laughs> Begin. This is basically a TED talk that I gave at Abilene Christian University several months ago uh, to begin a different direction for my speaking where I'm actually providing not only my stories but hopefully my, mm -hmm. my advice and I will be sharing this with TWU students. I would imagine 90% of the advice you're going to hear today uh, in this portion for me you already know but it might be something you can share with others and tell me if I'm on the right track. Some 50 years ago, Catherine Childers made history as one of the first female special agents selected to carry the badge of the United States Secret Service, one of five young women who shot holes in the glass ceiling of federal law enforcement, the first women in the history of the Secret Service to do so. Her job was to keep some of the world's most important people alive. She took an oath to protect and serve the President of the United States at all cost. Her office, the White House, the Greek island of Scorpios, Hyannisport, and the bad streets in New York, Washington, and Los Angeles, where she worked undercover investigations. She also investigated threats against the president. Her life reads like a script for an action movie, one that would scare most women to death. The story she will share with you today is real. Making history was a personal best for Catherine. Opening doors in an arena of first opportunities for women is her legacy. As a little girl, her father taught her how to face fear with a dead-eye aim, and she's been doing it ever since. Today, she will share his simple advice that changed her life and might change yours. Please welcome Catherine Childers. I grew up in the heart of Utah, a little tiny town called Pleasant Grove, a little bitty town, at the, really at the foot of these mountains, right in here. I show a winter shot because it's so darn hot down here, so I remember it makes me cool. And growing up, I didn't have many mentors. Who, who was I going to grow up to be? And they didn't even ask. The general and I last night we were talking about, no one asked us what we wanted to be when we grew up. No one gave us opportunities, but I knew one person, one sharpshooter. <laughs> Her name was Annie Oakley, and I wanted to be Annie Oakley. I had the dog. I had an old horse that I referred to as a plug, and my father would say, Roxy's not a plug. She's a Mustang. Well, she had broken teeth, you know, and she'd been trained to haul seven, five kids, four or five kids at the program. But anyway, and I said, Daddy, I've got the fringe jacket. I've got all the parts. I'm going to be like Annie Oakley. She's in the Buffalo Bill Wild West show. She's famous. She's doing interesting things, and she's a really good shot. But I don't know how to shoot the old 22. So I said, well, one of these days, so one day, in the heart of this little community where we live, he brought an old can out of a, a container or somewhere and he peeled a, probably an old vegetable soup can, I don't recall. And he said, all right, today's the day you're going to learn to shoot the old 22. So he took the can, put it, oh, I don't know, not that far, but about the middle of that table over there, and he handed me the old 22. And I remember what it smelled like. 
if, as little kids, you know, you know where the guns were, the hunting guns. It wasn't the time of the tragedy of the gun issues now, but it was an old 22. It was all beat up. It was heavy. And when I, he put it up on my shoulder, it smelled like gunpowder and oil and those oily rags and daddy's old hunting coat. And he said, OK, look down. Look down there. See that little red dot at the bottom? Now put it right at the bottom of the can and breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and then start to squeeze the trigger and let it surprise you. It wasn't much different than the way they taught me in the secret system. Breathe in, breathe out, and then I started to cry. Tears running down my head. It was heavy. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be kind of easy and it would turn me into any <laughs> He took the gun away from my shoulder and he held it and he said, Catherine, what's wrong? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I said, I'm just, I'm just scared to do it. And he said, well, do you want to do it? I said, oh, yes. I want to grow up and be Annie Oakley. I want to do something. I want to make a difference. I want to be somebody. And he patted me on the shoulder and he said, then just do it scared. So you are scared. It's something you're going to have to live with your whole life. So if you just put that scared card in your pocket and Move on and do it scared anyway and cross that scared line with your little rock room boots and just don't stand there quaking that you're scared of whatever it is. He said, you'll live an interesting life. Well, I did that. I got the gun back up. It was still heavy. I aimed. I got the gun and bam! I hit that can and it went about 15 feet in the air and I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. That little girls, because he said, you know, you're just a girl. No one says that now. But he said, you're just a little girl, and you don't need to do that. But I did it, and I ended up in a situation where I realized that being athletic, being skillful, was going to be something that I could use my entire life. And the bottom line was, uh, if I did it right, if I used my athletics in, in, in high school, back in, at the University of Colorado and in high school in Colorado, I was athletic, and people thought I was a tomboy. Nowadays, if you're athletic, you're an Olympic hopeful. And I went to the, I went to, to Colorado, and I, I uh, thought, you know, but where everything's happening is Washington. This is where things are happening. But nobody asked me what I was going to do or what I was going to major in or what this or what that. All my mother said was, go to the University of Colorado, get a degree in education, which was about all we had was education. If you were smart enough you could uh, to be a nurse, you could probably have been a neurosurgeon, but there was some nursing programs in education, but not very many options. And she said, the main thing you need to do is get an MRS degree. <laughs> Masters of Related Science? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. No, and I failed miserably. I didn't find a husband. So I was in big trouble. I had an education degree. I was interested in doing something of important, and I decided I wanted to go to Washington, D.C. I was at the University of Colorado, and I was an active student. It was a tough time. It was a very turbulent time, 1969. The dean of women, I still remember her name, Polly Parrish, had tapped me to a lot of uh, student leadership positions because I was president of the Panhellenic Association. I was a sorority girl of all things with an education degree, and yet I wanted to go to Washington and make a difference. So she picked up the phone. I was talking with her, like I imagine the general talks with students here, trying to encourage me to move forward. She picks up the phone, and she said, let me call Don. And I thought, Don? Who's Don? Don is the congressman. She goes, Don, this is Polly Parrish, and I've got a young woman named Catherine Clark sitting in my office who's got gumption. She's got husband. And I think you need to hire her to be on your staff in Washington. And he said, can she type? <laughs> Typing in those days was the kiss of death. It was the only thing they really taught young women well. I don't know how many of you remember sitting in an old old royal typewriter where you go, now's the time for all good men to come to the air. <laughs> Did you notice they never mentioned, now's the time for all good women to come to the air of their country? Oh, no. But I was a good typist. I was pretty good. I think you had to type 90 words a minute to be able to qualify for anything. Anyway, she said, do you type? I said, yeah, yeah I, yes, I, I can type, but I can do other things. 
But you know what? That's one of the messages I particularly give to younger women. Sometimes you have to bite the bullet to get through the door. So I said, okay, I type, and I went off to Washington, D.C., a city that I still have a terrible case of potent, Potomac fever. They ask me, what's Potomac fever? The Potomac River just grabs your heart. And if you've ever spent time there or worked there, the general, I'm sure, will reassure that. It's just a magical place. I drove into Washington. I got the job with the congressman. As it, it really wasn't a type of student. It was a little bit higher than that. But I couldn't believe I was there. And I didn't know what would be next. I wear this necklace. Everybody laughs at my necklace. But it's a chameleon. Because I've changed my life as a lizard. You know how lizards change their color all the time, depending where they're sitting, depending where they're going, depending who they're talking to. I had loved the the Capitol. I've only been there two two months, but then I heard a friend of mine. We had lunch in the Capitol dining room. She said, "You won't believe this, but they're hiring female bodyguards for Trisha Nixon for the president." I said, "Really? Bodyguards? Like agents?" And she said, "Yes," but she said, "I don't know if I want to do it. You you have to be you have to be really you have to know how to shoot a gun." Because <laughs> I failed to tell you, I was on the rifle team in high school. It was the only sport we had. And this old woman in Pete Wentworth had actually started a rifle team for girls, for girls in the basement. So I was one of the best shots in the state of Colorado. So that's okay. And she said, a and you might have to die for the president. Well, I hadn't gotten a husband, so there was no reason to live. <laughs> Secret Service, downtown Washington, not too far from the White House, filled out the application. I wasn't even sure what I was asking for. What, I don't know what special agents do, but I walked in for an interview with this man, Clint Hill. Clint Hill was then deputy director and had been the man who had jumped on the back of the, left on the back of the limousine that fateful day in Dallas, saving Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy, pushing her in the back of the limousine hanging on the back of that, that car, elevating, going up to 40, 50 miles an hour on his way to Parkland Hospital. A feat that was absolutely miraculous. Later in my Secret Service training, they, they gave us the idea that this is what we're going to do. We were in tennis shoes, we were 22, we were athletic, you've got to go here when we say go, we're going to accelerate the limousine and you've got to run forward, pull up, get in, and none of us could do it. So what he had done was an absolute miracle. And here I sat, 22, 23 years old, sitting with a man that I've watched in 1963, as we all did, over and over and over again. And I remember saying to myself, who is that man? And why is he doing that? And how remarkably brave he must be. Well, he explained to me that the Secret Service protected the president, the vice president, foreign heads of state, candidates, political candidates, which had just started after Bobby Kennedy had been assassinated and did investigations of crimes against the counterfeiting and the, 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 basically the money of the country. After the Civil War, we had all sorts of money. We have dollars, we have this and we have whatever, and they really started the Secret Service as a part of the Treasury Department to try to squelch that, that and make the currency safe. And they also felt by training you to be not only a special agent in protection, but a special agent that investigated crimes that it kept you sharper. You had more skills. He asked me the last, the last question. He said, well, you'd have to be trained. You'll carry uh, some machine guns. You'll have to carry a 357 Magnum. I'll talk to you later about that. And he said, but the big thing is that our organization is one of the most elite in the world, and we are here to protect and serve at the service of the president at all costs. Would you be willing to die for the president? Not maybe not in so many words. But I had that same gut-wrenching, scared feeling, and I said, yes, I would, and I would be honored to serve. Because in those days, there were so few opportunities for women to serve their country. Well, remarkably, they hired me and five other women. I'm the one on the right in the stylish boots. I get a lot of jokes about that. Uh, <laughs> Director James J. Rowley hired us in 1970. And then a year later, we were actually sworn in as the first female agents. They trained us for a year and then decided, well, we cut the mustard, so they trained us for a year. And, and I would say the Secret Service was pretty much ready for us at that time. But was the public ready? 
they didn't know what to do with the idea that Washington was actually crazy enough to hire women to become special agents in the Secret Service. And this is, this is the actual Dateline Washington. This is the actual newspaper, and this is what it said. Five young women took the oath of office today as special agents of the U.S. Secret Service and became the first of their sex to join the 106-year-old history of the agency. This is where it gets really interesting. Customarily, they would be referred to as pretty, or at least attractive. <laughs> I have trouble reading this. Since that is, the, is true of most young women successful in their career, they entered in the room with their faces averted and were sworn in with their backs to the photographers and the television cameras because we would be working undercover by a counterfeit money. This gets interesting. Three are brunette, one a golden blonde, the fifth had short, frosted, dark hair, all had light, well-shaped figures. <laughs> Talk about hidden figures. <laughs> Little did they know that we'd been trained for over a year, we could have broken his pencil in five different pieces and killed him with our thumbs. <laughs> we were top all they cared about was that we had light figures. I'll be honest, I didn't know what light meant, so I looked it up, that was before I was a writer, and I thought, well, that's kind of nice. Uh, we are there. <laughs> so off we went at $7,000 to $8,000 a year to protect the President of the United States with our lives if necessary, which was fun. That, that, that was, you know, that was the kind of situation that I never would have dreamed that I would even be in anyway, so we can do this. These were the things they issued me. They issued me a gun, a 357 stub nosed revolver, uh, with hollow point, for those of you who know about it, magnum weapon bullets, a, a handcuffs, a badge, a commission book, and the commission book said that I was on a mission for the President of the United States. There's always a little funny part about all this, it had no number. My badge said 07, which I liked because of Jay, James Bond. <laughs> but it had no number, so I couldn't cash checks with it. And here it said I was on an international mission. The handcuffs were kind of a funny story because I, I had friends who couldn't believe I was doing this, and I was carrying this big, heavy bag of equipment around. And I was dating one fellow on the hill, and he said, so what's in your purse? I said, my, my gear, my equipment, the things they gave me. He said, oh, what do special agents carry in their purse? And I said, oh, a gun. I said, but they just trained me with handcuffs. And he said, you have handcuffs in your purse? <laughs> and I walked over to him and I said, yes, I have handcuffs in my purse. So I pulled up the handcuff and I went, boom! And before he knew it, his arm was handcuffed to the chair, which was funny for a moment until I realized I didn't have the key. <laughs>
representative in the United States. And so you did get to at least talk and be friendly. We weren't friends, but by any means, my most interesting assignment was the Princess of Spain who would become the Queen of Spain. She was only 32 and was absolutely infatuated with the United States and asked me many questions about going up here and whatever. But the important thing to me was both the responsibility to protect and serve, but the places we went and the things we saw with these important people were quite phenomenal. This one was, I would say, the bell ringer. America's vast expenditure on the conquest of space certainly begins to look well worthwhile as the Apollo 14 mission successfully puts the fifth and sixth men on the moon. They're bringing back the largest ever haul of lunar samples and scientific data. Astronauts are a rare and distinguished breed. Alan Shepard, Stuart Brewster, and Edgar Mitchell, the crew of Apollo 14, have proved it yet again. Their extensive training enabled them to put right several last-minute malfunctions. In an unmanned craft, this would have meant abandoning the program. kidnapping, anything out of the ordinary that we were there to protect. In fact, it's interesting to know that this man, this man, this man, this man, this man, this man, and two others over here and I were all agents. So that gives you an idea of the parameter of coverage that we had. But as I sat behind the man who had walked on the moon, the king of Spain looked to him and said, what was it like to walk on the moon? And I heard him say quietly, I felt very small. Remarkably charming man who certainly didn't take one step for mankind and a giant leap for mankind too seriously, or at least didn't in any way take as much credit as he should have. Yes, I worked at the White House. Uh, I, of all things, my elementary education degree came in handy because when they were looking for a teacher, for an agent to do the tours for the VIP friends of the president of the White House, all of those agents, all of those um, tour people are agents and they're carrying weapons and they're second security responsibility in addition to teaching. But because I had my elementary education degree, I was picked as the, the very special one who got to take people all over the White House and access in places that no one ever went. In fact, that was one of my first exposures to Jacqueline Kennedy on Nassus because she had been so much involved with the White House itself. Then I was assigned to the children of John F. Kennedy, little John. By the way, they never called him John Jr. He was always, um, what am I, it wasn't John John. Why am I blocking on that? We'll come back to that. But we know little John, Caroline. And I did make undercover buys all over the, the country, in New York, Chicago, Washington. And remarkably, I got pretty comfortable with playing roles of not so nice ladies. <laughs> Having been a uh, president of Pan Atlantic, I arrived in the, the city of Washington wearing my circle pin and my blue, blue outfit. And while I was in New York, oftentimes I was called upon to be like Jamie Lee Curtis and dress up like a prostitute uh, to make these arrests and essentially be the bodyguard for the agent who was making those, those arrests. We bought a lot of counterfeit money. Uh, on this particular buy, I dressed to be, a, appeared to be a stewardess sitting in the middle of JFK. Those kind of buys are always done in very open places so that the bad guys uh, are a little more cautious and it's just the way it happens. And we were making this big arrest in Washington and are in JFK 
and uh, I was supposed to sit there and listen to this undercover agent mm -hmm. and see what was going to happen. And I had ear combs in my ears and it actually had a chapstick cam that came down my arm and I would put on my chapstick and report to the headquarters of where we were making this arrest, uh, coordinating it, and would tell them what was happening out in the, the airport. Well, and we didn't know, it was a long delay and whatever, and Angie, this agent, finally comes down and sits down next to me, and I think, oh my goodness, this is blown, he's gonna, he starts to click his fingers, and he starts to sing, and he says, they're two in the car, they're parked in the taxi stand, they're the delay, the meat's coming in the locker, it'll be here, <laughs> and he's singing this song, you know, like people will sing or whistle, and tells me everything that's going on, and then I call back on my chapstick can and tell them that this is where the, the, the buy is developing. So you can see we became very uh, creative in what we did. And I, I, I later asked Angie, what was the key to being a good undercover agent? And he said, well, you have to be an actress. You have to play the part. And he really taught me how to do that. The training was tough. They taught me, like I said, to carry a 357 Magnum. I was one of the best shots at that. Jiu-Jitsu, undercover work. Uh, required a lot of knowledge of counterfeit money. Probably the most frightening experience that I, I, and I learned from was driving and doing a night stop. We were trained in vehicles. I drove the, the, the limousine behind, I mean the follow car behind the limousine. The, the training to do those kinds of things was intense, but this night stop was really something that I never forgot. They put another agent and I, a rookie agent, in a car and followed uh, instructor agents to the Beltsville training zone were going 100 miles an hour and our job was to pull up, put the gun and the badge out the window and say, Secret Service, stop, throw your cars, uh, throw your guns out the window, pull over, pull over. Well, they, they speeded up. Then all of a sudden they stopped. We almost hit them. We pulled back, we stopped. Then they went again. Meanwhile, then they finally stopped, threw their guns out the window. There's dust, there's rock, there's all this going on. And my partner said, did you count them? And I said, no, I, I couldn't see anything. And we're, we're down behind the, the, the doors of the car using that, just like in the movies. And he said, how many are there? I said, I, I can't see. We saw two in the lights of a car. And then all of a sudden, I feel the cold steel of a revolver behind my ear. And the, the, the fella says, bang, you're dead. That's where I learned about getting the drop on me. They had dropped him on the second stop. He rolled out, we didn't see it, he came behind us, and both of us would have been dead had we not counted, had we not paid attention to the details of what was going on in that rest. And they told us, bottom line, if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't, you need to trust your gut. I tell students, what's in your backpack? What of you have in skills? Look at my life. I was an elementary education teacher. I had good skills shooting a, an old 22 that my daddy taught me and I was one of the top shots in Colorado. I was a skier, I was a tennis player, I spoke a little German. For some reason, I out of hundreds of thousands of women, and I don't know who applied, but I was able to look in my backpack and keep saying, oh, I can do that. I was athletic. I had some background experience in, in PR and dealing with important people because I grew up work on the mill. And it's interesting, even now, I'm reinventing myself. We all are reinventing ourselves. And if you look in your back, back, backpack of skills and things that intrigue you and you've enjoyed doing and you're good at, somehow they can always come out and come to the top and reinvent you. I was talking to a student in New York and I said, what's, what's special about you? What's one thing in your backpack of skills that no one would believe? And typically they look down and they go, nothing. I said, no, that's not true. Let's pull that a little bit. What's really unique about you? And he said, well, I, I do magic. I said, magic? What kind of magic? He said, well, I've always liked to do magic tricks. I said, I got an old top hat from my grandfather and I take the train down to New York. And he was only 14. And for me, having come from Texas, where you don't take the train anywhere, this young man would go down every Saturday morning and take his top hat and put out a, a, a blanket and hopefully get a little money in the top hat and would practice his magic tricks. And he volunteered at a school to teach other kids how to do magic that, that, that didn't have any knowledge of that. And I said, and you're saving that money to go to college, right? He said, no, but I could. And I said, and you should. And that one thing 
elevated him out of the malaise of resume stuff. I talk about it being your gadgets, the things about you that you don't put on your resume, the things about you that make you more interesting or gutsy or have gumption or just the things that, that you don't think are of any merit whatsoever. And usually they will get you the job. My son applied to uh, Brown University and it, it was under awards. It's, and then he didn't have any particular awards. He was a very bright boy and had done a lot of things. I said, well, didn't you ever wear, win anything? And he said, well, I won the, the bike out of the weedy cereal box when I was eight. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, put it down, put it down. And he said, that's the, the, the comment that got more reaction from every interview he'd ever had, is he really won the bike out of the cereal box? <laughs> so sometimes you have to be creative. It's all in the details, reinvent yourself, and do it scared. I'm gonna go on, here, here I am as that shop. And that old woman told us a quitter never wins and a winner never quits. And along with my do it scared, just do it scared, that motto has also followed me. And it's interesting in having dinner with the general last, last night, she has so many wonderful advicisms, little things. The little things can keep you going when you remember them, and I compliment you on that. What a treasure you have there. So there I was. And my biggest one, and we really agreed on this one, was to keep a sense of humor. I think women these days sometimes take themselves too seriously. I think we all take ourselves too seriously. And sometimes if you just have a little laughter in the middle of it, it'll make everything work out just fine. Maybe not just fine, but get you through the rough, the rough spot. I was making an arrest with a really big guy right after they swore, to, swore in as agents. He was big. He could have played for the Dallas Cowboys. He'd been a police officer. He knew the whole deal. We were going down the hall to make an arrest of a woman who had been uttering, cashing federal checks. And we get a little closer and flash. I mean, there's music and people are slamming doors. And it's not a very nice part of town. And we're coming down and we genuinely take out our guns and come up to the door. And he bangs on the door. Boom, 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 boom. Secret Service, open the door. Nothing happened. You hear this swishing around on the floor. And the big, in training, they always said, get in quick. If it's counterfeit, if it's drugs, if it's assassins, if it's, it, and you've got to get in, take care of business and get them out, or they'll go out the back window, or the contraband will go down the toilet, or whatever. So we get to the door, and I'm standing there with my gun, and he's, he looks at me, takes a pause, and he said, you're so tough. Why don't you break down the door? <laughs> And you're so tough, you break down the door and I'll shoot them. I'm a lot better shot than you are. <laughs> and then I said, why don't we knock? <laughs> and she opened the door. We didn't shoot her. And the most important thing was I didn't get like Billy Go Gruff and try to break down this big metal door with my shoulder just to prove a point. What I did was say as a team, we are good together. Competing against one another for the common goal of to protect and serve wasn't going to do us any good. I use a sense of humor a lot. The details are also something you hear the Secret Service works in details. They call that the, comma, the, the cadre, the group, the military group. In the military general, do they refer to them as detail, advanced details? Yes. Okay. It's, it's a military kind of word that it means everybody working together for a common, common cause. Well, in the, the detail, they taught us to look for everything, to scan crowds of the details. Someone was sitting here in a big old, old fur coat, and it's now August, and, and I'd be watching for those details, people that keep adjusting something on their hip that might be a weapon. Someone who comes forward with a, a group of, I mean, a disarrayed amount of flowers and wants to pa pass it on to the first lady or someone I'm protecting. You're constantly looking for details. The other thing, the details are important are in the preparation. It's all in preparation. When the Secret Service prepares, for instance, the inaugural that you see go down Pennsylvania Avenue, every building has been cleared. There are cap team snipers on the top of every building watching for anything going in the crowd. The, the sewer caps are sealed hours before the presidential limousine that they call the beast goes down Pennsylvania Avenue. They go through anything and everything to keep that person, that person they're protecting safe. On this particular day, you may remember, 
President Ronald Reagan, and I was not a part of this detail, but I knew the woman Marianne Gordon who was. She was a rookie agent who'd just been assigned to the presidential detail. It was a normal advance, they call it. She was sent out to figure out how to get there, how to get back, who needed to be assigned to it, what vehicles they needed, and how long the president would be there. It was a brief luncheon. The thing that we were taught was you plan for the absolute worst and pray for the best, and when the day's finished and it's all been good, then you have a laugh and say, we made it yet again. But you take everything seriously. She, that day, had been the advance agent that had planned this. Her big job was to decide how they would go and how they would come back, maybe a mile and a half. Well, she was so nervous about not doing it right. It was her first advance, as far as I understand. So that night, on her own time, she drove the route six or seven times. And it was only a couple of miles, but she went this way in case the traffic was gone. She went that way in case there was a sewer break. She went the other way, and then she did the route to the, to the uh, hospital. Now, there was no need to really do that. Everybody knew where the hospital was, and normally in a situation when things go badly, you go right back to the White House. Well, that day, things went bad. As you can see that John Hinckley took a shot at the president. Let's go back to this one. This fell on it right here. This is an agent in the Sears suffered suit. As you can see, he's watching the president, and when shots rang out, he turned his body in front of John Hinckley and took, took the bullet. Agents don't duck. And that's what they do. They are there to save the lives of the people that they protect. Well, Jerry Parr, who was again one of the very kind older agents that adopted the women in the Secret Service and put us in several different uh, categories with foreign protection, whatever, he pushed President Reagan into the car, he radioed, and by this point the whole detail is in, in disarray because two people have been shot. It was, you know, it was, it was not the normal cadre. Mary Ann Gordon was in a car as an advance agent and heard him s signal to the D.C. police White House. So the three of them that were left in the long motorcade started to, to, the, to head to the White House. Park calls out, hospital, hospital. She, as a young rookie agent, pulled out in front, took over the lead and got them to the hospital because she had done it better, more, harder, longer, and stronger for a simple assignment and probably changed history. And Jerry, Agent Jerry Carr, who we've lost, gave her tremendous credit as being so detailed that they got him, got him to the hospital in, I think, under three minutes. I was assigned to Caroline and John Kennedy. That agent you saw in the beginning, Clint Hill, called me one day and said, Captain, you've done all these different assignments. We'd like to, for you to take over the protection of John and Caroline, particularly when they travel. He said, again, keep them happy, keep them safe, keep them from um, being kidnapped or, or harmed in any way, and keep them from embarrassing the President of the United States <laughs> or their mother, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. And I said, they're teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> he said, that's right, and you're a federal agent. <laughs> he said, go forward. <laughs> I traveled with the kids to the island of Scorpios, which was again was a fabulous experience just to be there. Uh, taking care or not taking care, they actually fondly called me the pistol pack and nanny. Because as a woman, you're always undercover. Nobody really knew who you were. So we added an extra, shall we say, barrier of security. Because when I was with Caroline, they either thought I was a nanny or a maid or a friend of the family or whatever. But I was carrying my, my weapon and all the, the, the gear that I need. I drove, I drove the car. I was another source of protection. On this one particular day, Caroline came out of school and said, as teenagers do, I've got a, I've got a tutor today. I've got, I've got a tutor. Quick, take me over to such and such and such and such. And I said, Caroline, it's not on the details. I don't have the list. I don't care. I have the tutor and I'm late. So I called in and I said, uh, Caroline needs to tutor, so we're going to take a bypass and go down First Avenue, or whatever. And they said, Roger that. And I was the only one with her that day. Usually there was another back of it. So we come up First Avenue, and, and she says, Turn, turn here. All right. So I pull up into the intersection, and there's nothing coming toward me. And I was not as familiar with New York as I probably should have been. But there was nothing coming, so I turn into the intersection, and bam, I'm T boned. 
and this fella in this odd looking car. I've just been to sniper training, I've just been to training. Always, always, we were going to expect what would happen in the case of a, of a kidnapping or that kind of thing. So I'm looking at the pull out my, my revolver, I tell her to get down on the floor, I pull out my revolver, I'm looking at the roof, I'm looking all around, I'm looking for the details, and here comes this fellow. He's probably 60 pounds overweight, can't walk very well, he's got those, those suspenders holding up his pants, a little pork pie hat, and a dribble coming down from his cigar. And he's happy. And I'm thinking, this does not look like a kidnapper to me. <laughs> so he comes up to the front of the car, I push him over the car, it's steaming, and I have the gun at his neck, and I say, Secret Service, you're under arrest, don't move. And he looks and he says, Lady, you hit me, you hit me. It's a runaway street. <laughs> so then I had to not only use my charm and my wit and <laughs> Gave him a card, got back in the car. By this point, there's traffic, everyone's gawking, and Caroline gets off the floor and she said, You know what? You're pretty good. <laughs> what I learned, however, was is with so many remarkable experiences that you can't have at all. Remember the experience of trying to handcuff my date to the chair? My dating was dismal. I hadn't met anyone. And I could see that I really did want to have children and have a life. And a, and a job like the Secret Service and the military, and many jobs that are the most interesting, the most exciting. I wanted to be the first woman director. I was ready. But I met a man from Texas. His name was Cecil Childers, a charming psychiatrist. And we dated long distance. He was from Corpus Christi. So imagine I moved from London, New York, um, Washington, uh, LA, to Corpus Christi. So I really had to reinvent myself, but I'll tell you about it. it was kind of, the fun part was he called me one day, I was shooting, I was on the ring, shooting oozies, with this long line of agents. And they all knew I had a boyfriend in Texas and gave me a lot of grief about it. And we're at the, the tower says, make your weapon safe, make your weapon safe. So I pulled out the clip and it's, everybody's, it's cold and their elbows are in the cement and they're, they're not happy. Here are these girls, they're always messing things up. I climb up to the top of the tower, pick up the phone, and it's my husband's doctor's nurse, of course, who can find people anywhere. And you know doctors don't dial the phone. They don't know how. She says, <laughs> in those days, she says, Catherine, it's Terry calling for Dr. Chandler. And I, you know, I've got 35 agents on the range waiting for me to come back. I thought maybe my mother was ill or something. Cecil gets on the phone and goes, Kate, Kate, what are you doing? I said, I'm shooting machine guns. What are you doing? And he said, I've got the ring. Will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> so I went on down to the, uh, to the uh, range, and the guy said, what was that? I said, oh, my boyfriend just proposed. And he said, well, what did you say? And I said, I said it wasn't a good time. <laughs> Love never is at a good time. But I went to Texas and reinvented myself, and the President Chancellor told me many things that I ended up doing. Strangely enough, everything I'd ever done when I went to Texas came in handy. They asked me if I wanted to do a television show, they asked me if I would be scared to interview important, important people. <laughs> and I said, no, as long as I don't have to keep them alive. <laughs> but I did have a television show for 18 years, talked to everyone from the kids raising goats out of the, the farms to James Mishner, Dolly Parton, and Lucille Ball. I asked Lucille Ball, I said, if your hair had been a different color, would your life have taken a different turn? And she said, oh, honey, my hair is a different color. And my life takes a different turn all the time. But it's better when it's red. <laughs> I asked James Earl Jones if, um, if uh, there was one thing no one knew about him, the voice of Darth Vader. And he said, yes, I was mute until I was six because I was a stutterer. And if you listen to his voice when he does the voiceovers and whatever, he's older now, but there was always a tiny bit of hesitation. And he said he found one teacher, like a teacher I would imagine that dot the campuses here in the programs that you have at TWU, that gave him the courage to do it scared because he was scared to death to talk. What was his it? The it was he was just afraid to talk. 
Well, I married this beautiful man from South Texas. He wore Luke Hazy boots and button-down collars and King Ranch shirts, and I fell in love with Texas and fell in love with him. And 10 years ago, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And the sparkle behind those bright blue eyes went away, and I became his caregiver. I reinvented myself again. I reinvented myself in a way that um, was not all that different than the Secret Service. I was his bodyguard, I was his caregiver, I was his friend, I was the one who kept him going for a period of time that he had real no knowledge of what his life was like. And I learned two really great pieces of advice that I added to my scared backpack. I was scared to death when they gave him this, this diagnosis, we walked out, I said, Cecil, are you scared about having Alzheimer's disease? And he was a physician, he trained people who did that kind of thing. And he laughed and he said, well, Everybody's got to die of something. Can we go get a water burger? <laughs> <laughs> he genuinely left it all up to me. I was the fixer. I'd been a fixer when my son had Alzheimer's. I'd been a fixer in public service in the community. I would bet 90% of you have said if you had one word that would describe you as a mother, as a teacher, as a friend, as a husband, it's that you're fixers or you wouldn't be here. What I realized, however, is that I couldn't fix him. And I realized it way too late because I would have him watch um, oh, PBS. I got him the, the pads where he had the games. I, I took him to courses. We went to psychiatrists. We, he just needed to be comfortable. He just needed to be happy. And he needed to be at my side. So what I finally realized, instead of saying, you need to do this, or why are you doing this, or you should know that, I learned to be kind rather than right because the kindness is what helped. And I realized that what he really wanted to do was watch Three Amigos at least four times a day. <laughs> <laughs> he was a wonderful, wonderful man and taught me a great deal about many things. You know, I've had a fascinating life and the do it scared part of it really has come up because I go all the way back to when my daddy said, just do it scared. If I hadn't taken that advice, my little buckaroo boots would have sat right there in the dirt. I would have put my head down. I would have gone back to what I thought was my regular life. I wouldn't have had the, the drive like John McCain to do something that mattered, to do something that was a part of something. I'm just an ordinary girl. But because I had the stuff in my backpack, and because I was, be with, I was willing to do it scared, I had a remarkable life. And what I've found now, and, I, and this is kind of interesting, the last time I saw Jacqueline Kennedy, many years ago, I ran into her, she looked just like this, the classic big sunglasses. I figured it out because she always wore sunglasses when she didn't wear makeup. Well, I didn't know that, I just thought that was her image. But you know, she set a lot of style for all of us. And when I saw her last, I had been on her detail with the children for some time, and she asked me how I was, and I said, well, I'm working undercover in New York, and I just protected the the Imelda Marcus, and yeah, she does have a lot of shoes. Yeah, she, actually, she was buying records when I was with her. But, uh, she looked at me, she smiled, and she said, Miss Clark, you live such an interesting life. And I thought to myself, Mrs. Onassis, it's so relative. <laughs> Here's this remarkable icon of American women telling me that I live an interesting life. But looking back at her, as I've gotten older, and now I've lost my husband, he died last year, and now that I'm trying to reinvent my life, where I'm probably, I'm not really scared I gave that up, but I'm working really hard to work out my last quarter and make something of it. I look back at her and I think what a great woman she was. If you think how she reinvented her life after that horrible tragedy, after being in the midst of an assassination of one of the most important men in our history, and how she went on, and how she did remarry, and how she did take her children to a safe place on an island, how she created an opportunity for them of privacy, how she reinvented herself. She became a publisher, and she wasn't a writer so much, but a publisher, and a remarkable woman. And I, I, I guess she's replaced by Annie Oakley. I think of her often, of her thinking, I lived an interesting life. Well, we've moved on, and now I'm writing a book called Do It Scared, and thanks to some very kind people here, it's going to be published by Texas A&M Press. Although I know Nancy has degrees from here, and uh, Mr. Pop uh, is very active.
activist, I can say, and I'm one of them very interested in the, uh, the, the press, and I understand your mother founded the press some 45 years ago. I have emphasized, and this is a work in progress on recovering our ideas, but I'm emphasizing the it, the it part. Because I've always said, well, they said, what, what have you learned in life? And I said, I've learned to do what's scary. But then it's determining what the it is. At our age, there are a lot of people, in that case, with trying to learn to shoot that old 22, the it was shooting that gun. Right now, I talk to women, particularly over 65 women who are widowed women who are reinventing themselves. And they don't know what the it is, but they're scared of it. So what I'm going to be telling your students today is define what your it's are. They'll change. You can't do it all at the same time. In my case, I gave up this incredible career to have a wonderful son, stepson, a wonderful husband, a career in South Texas that was extremely fun and, 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 and worthwhile with what I did. But at this point, my career is to try to pass on this information and my experience of doing something I think that would really scare most of people to death and suggest to everyone to put their can on the post and do it scary. Thank you very much. Thank you.